Kia ora, I'm Emil Bonovan, and today on The Detail, we're about a year out from the 2023 general election. And after a term dominated by COVID-19, the government is putting the pedal to the metal. The Fair Pay Agreement Bill passed in Parliament last night. Had another report regarding Three Waters this week. A new public media giant will be up and running by the middle of next year. Tangata Whenua will have their own health body. But on current polling, a change of government could be on the cards next year. And if that happens... By the time we get there in 2023, the reality is that not much will have happened, to be really honest with you. So I think it's going to be very easy for us to repeal and unwind. National and ACT, though, oppose the measures which they say will hurt small businesses and they vow to repeal the law if elected next year. But talking the talk is different from walking the walk. Sometimes pledges to repeal fall by the wayside and into the too hard basket. So today on The Detail, Newsroom Political Editor Joe Moyer and Stuff Political Reporter Thomas Manch discuss the big-ticket projects the government hopes to get over the line over the next year and whether they're likely to last if National takes power. Here's Joe Moyer. I think there is a lot happening, and I think probably the obvious reason for that in the first instance is that we've come out of what has been, you know, two and a half years of COVID and, I guess, breaks put on any ability to to do anything in particular um, as the country sort of somewhat ground to a halt there for a while. The government is in a situation now where it's playing a little bit of catch-up probably in terms of, uh, you know, what it came in um, in 2017 and then again in 2020 with its manifesto and the work that it wanted to do. But you're also starting to see some really big reform work come in as well. And, you know, obviously the government this time around has that single party majority government as well, which is a a very unique position to be in, um, in an MMP environment. So um, it's an opportunity for them now to crack on with things, uh, especially now that they've been released a little bit um, by the, that sort of handbrake that was COVID there for a while, not to mention the handbrake previously that was New Zealand first (laughs) in the the last term of government. You know, there's also an election in a year's time and, and the polls are tightening. And I think there probably is a little bit of an element of, you know, we want to get things done because we don't know where we might be in a year's time as well. So there's probably a few sort of different pushes going on there. But, um, yeah, certainly feels as if there's a lot lot happening. For those of us down in Wellington, it seems uh, pretty manic at the moment in yeah. terms of that work. Thomas Manch is a political reporter with Stuff. There's a lot of big projects, a lot of big labour projects, um, you know, very much um, tied into their, their view of how government should be done. And I think in part the reason why there feels like this concentration is that the timeframes have sort of been accelerated for this government because of the COVID-19 pandemic in a way, mm-hmm. you know. It's like anyone else, it sort of feels like two years has in a way been lost. Things were being progressed, obviously, throughout this period. But, you know, with the 2023 election approaching, there's a sort of deadline, an uncertain deadline to their work. And now, you know, everything that's in the pipeline is really being is being pushed. Well, let's talk a bit about some of these big ticket items, what they are, what they would do, what point in the legislative cycle that they are in, and then um, finish up talking about what their future might be if there is a change of government next year. Maybe we'll begin with one that I think it's of a royal ascent now. It's pretty much a, a done deal, which is fair pay agreements. Remind us what these are in brief. The fair pay agreements passed third reading um, in the House last week. New Zealand Labour. 64 votes in favour. New Zealand National. 33 votes opposed. Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand. 10 votes in favour. Act New Zealand. 10 votes opposed. Te Party Māori. 2 votes in favour. The ayes are 76, the noes are 43, the ayes have it. Fair pay agreements bill, third reading. So yes, like you say, like a, a, a done deal effectively. So fair pay agreements... They basically allow um, entire industries to to negotiate um, for contracts for every one of its workers. So these co- these will officially come into effect in December. Mm-hmm. The sort of idea behind it is that you can enter those negotiations if a thousand workers in an industry or occupation or ten percent of the workforce, so whichever bit is smaller, mm-hmm. demand a fair pay agreement. Then basically employers will have to try and negotiate one. It's it's now a given that if that number comes together and says we want action, then an employer has to try and negotiate that. So I think, you know, we're going to start to see the likes of hospitality um, sort of moving into that space and, and there will be plenty of industries and occupations who will now be starting to look to do that as well.
This is a classic Labour Party piece of legislation, this one. So if there is a change of government next year, has National talked about what it would do if it does lead the next government? Would this be repealed? It would. It would. That's the um, sort of assurance that National is, uh, is providing at the moment. Uh, well, if employers like the terms and conditions, there's nothing to stop them keeping those terms and conditions. Uh, what we're opposed to is the one-size-fits-all approach to the whole uh, employment relations. Obviously, there's a bit of water to pass under the bridge until next year, and um, there's uh, talk about, you know, and we see reporting of um, the unions being very keen to get some fair pay de- um, agreements across the line and hoping, hoping to sort of, like, entrench the system, so to speak. Countdown workers are set to get a big pay rise, and it could lay groundwork for a sector-wide fair pay agreement. Employees have voted on a 12% increase, a starting living wage, plus improvements to pandemic and sick leave. It puts the supermarket on track to have some of the highest wages in the industry. First Union thinks the move could set the basis for other workplaces to push for more. So that it's harder for it to be repealed. You've got to wonder what the tolerance would be for National, would be um, in terms of ripping up these ag- agreements mm. if there were to be you know, one or more in place. Um, after 2023 and then they were to form a government. But uh, as it stands, yeah, that's the commitment. Um, an absolute Gornberger for National on that one. 100% would repeal it. There's just, like you say, I mean, it's classic Labour-based policy and National has been very against it and have been quite vocal about that and would 100% repeal it. Right, we come now to the RNZ TVNZ merger, uh, or rather the... Uh, creation of a new public broadcasting entity. This is pretty much what it says on the tin, right? Like you, you, you hear what it is, and that is what it is. It is a um, the creation of a great big public broadcasting entity. Yep, a hundred percent. So. I hope you're not going to ask me to explain why it's happening because I am still none the wiser, to be honest. Despite asking many people that question, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess. What people are saying is the idea is that you want like a pure public broadcaster in the same way that, you know, you have in with the BBC, for example, that seems to be a sort of model for it. And, you know, other countries have it too, Canada, Ireland, etc. I guess the difference there is, you know, New Zealand doesn't have a population base like those countries. And also we, we do have a fairly diverse media landscape already and probably the interesting thing in the last couple of weeks in this space has been the select committee met and it was an opportunity for all media companies, media bosses um, to submit on whether they thought that this was a good idea or not and that was fascinating because the, um, the pushback and the, I would say, anger at the concept from bosses from the likes of Stuff, News Hub, Discovery, NZME, etc., see this as something that will really harm them if not, you know, sort of kill them. Existential threat, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's it's a really controversial space at the moment and the idea is that this new entity will actually come into force in, in March next year. Um, so, yeah, everything's in front of the select committee process at the moment and, and whether there's changes or not, there's been, certainly there's been a lot of requests for changes, but it'll be interesting to see the select committee report and, and what they actually recommend um, at the end of that process. I think there's a risk that, um, you know, I mean, we obviously work in the industry, so it's it's of acute interest to us. Mm. But, I mean, if, if a new national government was to come into place, well, you know, why would you bother unwinding it if it had gone down the road, you know, and, and had merged? And, I mean, um, Melissa Lee is, you know, my um, colleague Glenn, Glenn McConnell reported um, the other day that Melissa Lee has sort of caveated their, their promise to repeal that, um, you know, unless it's gone very far. I'm not moving to stop it. That's very unlikely. And this is happening soon. So would you move to dismantle it? Well, uh, this government is actually not very good at delivering, so we shall see how far it will go. But I don't think they will go very far. TVNZ will continue to be TVNZ. RNZ will continue to be RNZ. I'm not so sure what the new entity is supposed to be, but they haven't actually shown us what that is. And and that is... So you're predicting it's not even going to actually... No, I don't think it's going to go very far, so it won't be very difficult to dismantle it. But let's you know, and so if it has gone very far, maybe they maybe they wouldn't budge on it. And you know, when you talk about the sort of like the tolerances National might have for the reversals, you've got to think that this one sits in the space where it's it's more likely not to be a promise they'll ultimately end up keeping, if if the politics of it is, is suitable for that. There are question marks over whether it will go ahead. There's certainly um, 
what seems to be a reasonable rumble at the moment around about if the government is looking to sort of clear some things off its decks because there is a lot going on at the moment and that's starting to cause a little bit of controversy and a little bit of difficulty for them and this is a bit of a sort of why are you doing this, why are you spending money on this? Um, and the feeling from some seems to be that um, you know it may not go ahead and it might be an easy one for the government to just kind of get off the... Too hard basket. To, yeah, put it in the too hard basket and just kind of go, oh, well, you know, we gave that a go and it hasn't worked out. So if there is a change of government next year, the RNZ TV NZ merger is gone, Burger? Yes, if it's actually been progressed by the government in the first place. Which is a pretty big Which has a pretty state. big question mark over it, I would say, yeah. Thomas, you now have the unenviable task of explaining the essence of three waters in two minutes or so. Good luck to you. Your time starts now. Well, three waters, I mean, yeah, good one. Um, <laughs> it's a um, it's a project to cent- centralise how how um, how water systems are run in this country, and that's drinking water, stormwater and wastewater. Currently, obviously, councils administer these systems. They're infrastructure heavy. They often uh, require a bit of debt to run, and they are not in fit shape across the country. Some councils do it better than others, obviously, but um, by and large, the government believes that it's uh, unsuitable and the quality is not good enough. Um, that was highlighted many years ago by the um, the issue up in Havelock North, um, which uh, a lot of people seem to have sort of forgotten about. Some schools are shut in Havelock North this morning as the town remains in the g- grip of a gastric outbreak. The compiler-backed uh, outbreak has left two elderly people in a critical condition. To be honest, what this suggests is that there has been some poo, probably of an animal origin, getting into the water. And, um, you know, there's other things potentially that might be in there as well. Basically, the um, the project overall is to centralise. Um, there will be four public entities formed that administer water, these water services. The local councils um, will sit, will, will provide people to sit on boards that help administer these public entities. Um, these boards will appoint directors and, and people with expertise in running such systems to the entities. And this is where the co-governance question comes in as well. Mm. So the boards will also have iwi or mana whenua representatives, and um, that's where a lot of the politics has become quite contentious. Again, not necessarily about will water be better as a result of this, but how are these assets managed, governed and run? So the idea is that you centralise it, you take it off their balance sheets, it is managed from afar and there's also all these other sort of elements to it that have become a bit controversial around whether there'd be a co-governance element to it, what sort of rights mana whenua would have, etc. Mm. You've obviously seen in the past week Auckland and Christchurch mayors get together, both new mayors obviously, saying we're not into this, we're not interested Three mayors have proposed their own changes to the contentious Three Waters scheme. The new proposal would maintain the new water regulator but keep local ownership, control and accountability. Which is not unsurprising really because these are councils who, you know, have put a lot of money in and, and, you know, by all accounts have reasonable systems in place and and they're sort of saying, well, we don't want our ratepayers to have to pay for the people that haven't managed things very well. Mm which is a little bit of a difficult argument because if you've got a small ratepayer base, it's actually really difficult to maintain big infrastructure systems. So um, it's not really an apples for apples in that sense. This is a fascinating one, isn't it, in terms of what might happen if there is a change in, in government in the sense that we're talking about massive structural changes here. Again, things that would seem very, very difficult to undo. So has National made any promises or, or sent any signals as to what it would do were it to go into government when it when it comes to three waters? Well, I think I heard National Leader Christopher Luxon on Morning Report this week sort of not really providing a plan per se. We've, we've worked really closely with the uh, Communities for Local Democracy, which is those 31 to 35 mayors that have been really um, you know, against and opposed to three waters. A lot of what you saw today, uh, or saw this week, came, came out of that thinking. And so you know, a lot of what has been proposed we're quite comfortable with. Um, we think that makes sense. We just should get in the room with the councils and nut it out and actually agree on the final detail of it. But I think it's quite clear that their vision would be less centralised, more local say, you know? Mm-hmm. And how that would be arranged is uh, I'm not clear on. They're not interested in it at all, and they have come out very much in line with what uh, the Auckland and Christchurch mayors have, and, and other, to be fair, other mayors have joined in on, on that sort of bandwagon as well. National 
appreciates that there is an issue here. I mean, I don't think anyone can say that the country's infrastructure, water infrastructure system is good. I mean, look at Hawke's Bay, for example, and the issues we had there where, you know, tragically people actually died because their drinking water was not up to scratch. I mean, this is not a light issue by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and, you know, National accepts that there is an issue, but certainly doesn't agree with the government's approach to it. Another element of this that might potentially go is part of the wider health ref- reforms, the Māori Health Authority. Remind us about how this sort of came into being and, and kind of what it is. So, again, I think we can all agree that the health sector has been um, a little bit diabolical for quite a long time and, you know, has been underfunded over um, many governments. Mm. There was a, a report that was done uh, in the last term of government. Um, Heather Simpson did an independent report and basically a whole bunch of recommendations came back. Andrew Little, the health minister, ultimately ended up going further and decided to scrap those 20-odd DHBs yeah. and said... Consistency and cohesion is what the government is promising in a massive shake-up to the health system. The 20 DHBs will be gone and a new body, Health NZ, will be set up along with a specific Māori health unit. The health, health Minister, Andrew Little, says it will save lives and end the postcode lottery where people get different care depending on where they live. So that's Health NZ is now kind of the overarching arm. Mm-hmm. The sort of other arm of that, which has become the particularly controversial bit, is that the government decided to introduce... A new Māori Health Authority will make policy decisions alongside the new mainstream health service, Health NZ. It will have the ability to choose the services it wishes to fund, something many Māori in, health, in the health sector have been crying out for. The Māori Health Authority will have a lot more power. It also has uh, seats on the overall Health NZ board Board and basically will work a lot more collaboratively with the sort of Health NZ main system. The argument from National throughout has been that, and not just National, other parties as well, has been that you should have one health system that should serve everyone well. We have to understand that we either have a country built on a separate uh, system for uh, Māori versus every other New Zealander, we have a system that is based on equality and of bringing opportunity through to every New Zealander, uh, irrespective of race. The argument, of course, is that, well, actually, Māori and Pacifica health statistics are just so negative and so horrendous in every single category you can possibly think of that they've been um, done such a disservice that actually we need to do something different and separate to help bring all of that back up. Sure. National's argument is that you could do that with a Māori health directorate that sits as its own sort of department within Health NZ Mm. and to actually have a separate entity with its own board, its own money, its own sort of power um, is not, you know, where New Zealand is at in 2022. I think they have they have different perspectives on how on how these um these issues this issue should be tackled, you know, and um, I mean it's a bit of an easy target for them. It fits the sort of their sort of opposition to co governance, which is very much a, a more of a of a Labour view of of how these matters should be um should be administered. Um, and you know when I think of this, I think of sort of um. Labor's response to the social, uh, to national social investment policy, you know, fundamentally different way about how they think they should um, administer social support. Mm-hmm. And Labor government, so national government creates a social investment agency. Uh, Labor government comes in in 2017, you know, in theory probably wanted to scrap it because it's very much a, a, a national branded policy objective. Mm-hmm. Instead, what they do is they rebrand it and they sort of depower the agency and it's now called the Social Wellbeing Agency, I believe, and is doing, is doing sort of less work in that space. So, I mean, I meant, you know, there's room for that, that kind of an approach being taken. You know, maybe it won't be the Māori Health Authority anymore, but it'll, it'll be a smaller policy unit or something like that. Lots of the time you'll sort of, you'll talk the game about repeals and stuff like that when you're in opposition, but then when you, if and when you actually get into government, it's sort of like, wow, well, hmm, actually maybe this uh, wasn't as bad as we thought, or maybe this is actually going to be really difficult to do and we would need to replace it with something and actually we have other priorities. How much of this from National is, is bluster to, to win support or stormy rhetoric and how much is actual... 100% this is going to like this is a an, a really interesting talking point that act leader David Seymour often discusses yeah. and I had a really interesting conversation with him a couple of weeks ago when I was talking to him about the campaign 
um, next year. And, you know, his argument is that uh, there is so little difference between the centre-left and the centre-right when it comes to National and Labour that they have all of this big chat about how they're going to change all of these things and then ultimately don't follow through with it. And I guess there's two elements of that. They they don't follow through with it because it's just too hard and these other priorities and the things that you talked about. But also fundamentally it's just not that big a deal as well Mm. and you know if things are already in train because we are a small country if you've thrown a whole bunch of money at sort of setting something up is it really smart politics to have to admit that you're kind of going to now waste all of that money Mm. because you've had a change of government and especially if it's not really doing any damage I suppose for want of a better description if it's like completely against what you as a party, you know, your fundamental principles, then I think, you know, you do see repeals and you do see change. But otherwise, I feel like it's a little bit of a, oh, well, we'll tweak it and make it a little bit more like we would have wanted it. But yeah, David Seymour, I think, kind of makes this point a lot that you, this is in an MMP environment, you kind of almost need to look at kind of what the other ends of the, the political spectrum um, are doing and, and how big their vote is and, and what that might mean because actually it's the Green Party and, and the ACT Party who ultimately kind of prop up on an MMP system, National Labour, who always have the more kind of radical ideas. And David Seymour has, has been quite frank about how he doubts that very little will be repealed and changed under Chris Luxon unless ACT gets a really big vote and has a whole bunch of leverage right. and can actually have a bunch of bottom lines mm. that Christopher Luxon, if he is going to be the Prime Minister, has to accept. That's it for today. I'm Emile Donovan. The detail is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air and produced by Newsroom for RNZ. You can get us downloaded free to your mobile device every weekday from any podcast platform. Today's episode was engineered by Flo Wilson and produced by Sarah Robson. Bonnie Harrison is our associate producer, and thanks to Joe Moyer and Thomas Match. Matewa. Te